You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. A member of the Macintosh team, Bud Tribble, coined the phrase reality distortion field in 1981. Captain Pike has an illusion, and you have reality. He used the obscure Star Trek term to describe Steve Jobs' uncanny ability to charm, bully, manage, and manipulate people into believing his vision. He could even fool himself. Elizabeth Holmes was always competitive. She was good at science. She was accepted into Stanford University in 2002 to study chemical engineering. She told her family that she wanted to be a billionaire. Holmes wrote a patent in a few days without sleep. It involved an arm patch that could diagnose and even treat medical disease. She was so confident of her idea that she decided to turn it into a business. Her new firm combined the words therapy and diagnosis, Theranos. Eileen Lee coined the term unicorn in an article for TechCrunch in 2013. This meant young, unlisted tech companies valued at at least $1 billion. She counted 39 of them. They were all able to raise huge amounts of money in private funding without going to the stock market. The most famous example of a unicorn at the time was Uber, valued at $3.5 billion, and had raised $361 million from investors. By 2014, Theranos rose from valued at $165 million to $9 billion. Elizabeth Holmes was worth $4.5 billion. Here is Holmes on CBS This Morning. I work all the time, and um, I'm basically in the office from the time I wake up and then working until I go to sleep every day. Today, Elizabeth Holmes has a net worth of zero. There's a cost to manipulating reality. If you're right, then the ends justify the means. You're the visionary you believe you are. If you're wrong, people get hurt. In the wrong field, they could even die. Wall Street journalist veteran John Carreyrou came to the Theranos story in 2014. He was contacted by pathologist Adam Clapper, who doubted that the company's much-lauded finger-prick blood tests could ever work. He smelled a rat, but felt he couldn't go up against an extremely litigious tech behemoth. Clapper needed an investigative journalist. The result was a series of articles by Carreyrou in the Wall Street Journal, questioning the veracity of Theranos' claims. Those articles led to Kerry Rue's 2018 book, Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup. In this book, Insight, we'll chart the rise and fall of Theranos. We'll go into the people involved and the events as they unfolded. We'll look at the combination of technical failure, toxic culture, and hubris that ruined the company. Shanak Roy developed a pinprick blood test in the Stanford University lab. The test was simple and painless, a huge attraction for millions of people who hate needles. Holmes made him co-founder of Theranos. The small team developed the concept further. The finger is pricked, then a couple of drops of blood go into a small cartridge. You insert the cartridge into a toaster-sized box. In the box, data is read and sent to a cloud server. The analysis results would beam back to the reader. Patient diagnosis would be painless, quick, and accurate. Here's Holmes again on CBS This Morning. Healthcare is the leading cause of bankruptcy. You'll see her either in a black turtleneck or a white lab coat, taking a high-tech approach to blood testing. Instead of a needle to the arm, it's a pinprick to the finger. Holmes is marketing Theranos as a faster and cheaper alternative to a process that hasn't meaningfully changed in decades. Holmes combined charisma with an entrepreneur's hyper-optimism. Henry Mosley, Theranos' head of finance, recalled that when she was talking to you, her blue-eyed gaze made you feel like the center of the universe. There was only one problem. The system only worked some of the time. In demonstrations Holmes made to pharmaceutical companies, the readings were not in real time and did not relate to the actual samples. Theranos would play a pre-recorded reading of a sample to make it seem there was a live test, similar to Steve Jobs' famously buggy and near-fraudulent demo of the iPhone. 
The problem with the Theranos technology was that making it workable in the way Holmes imagined was complex, perhaps even impossible when using so little blood. There's a good reason blood tests use traditional needles. You need a good amount of blood to get diagnostic accuracy. Holmes wanted to automate a process that normally required people in a lab operating bulky machines. She obsessed with the dimensions of the Theranos device and demanded to make it smaller. She liked to describe the Theranos products as the iPod of healthcare and even hired an Apple product designer who worked on the iPhone. The word vaporware means overpromising to consumers so they'd get in line to buy the next tech product. Unfortunately, healthcare is something quite different from computing. You're no longer playing with technology. You're risking lives. Holmes had an apparent messiah complex. She existed on little sleep, kept afloat by chocolate-coated coffee beans that gave her a permanent caffeine high. She considered herself a visionary, world changer on par with Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. Here is Carrie Rue speaking to Jim Cramer on Mad Money. I like to say that this is different from a Bernie Madoff type of fraud in that she dropped out of Stanford really wanting to be an entrepreneur and her idol was Steve Jobs and she idolized Apple. She really wanted to replicate that success story. And I don't believe that she dropped out with this notion that she was going to pull long con and defraud investors. Jobs rose to success by exaggerating what his software could do and shipped buggy products. You can't do this with medical devices. You get annoyed when software isn't delivered on time. But when blood testing doesn't work, you can die from misdiagnosis. Theranos burned through its earlier rounds of funding by 2007. Its earnings were next to nothing. The company was kept afloat thanks to a large loan from Holmes' boyfriend, Ramesh Sunny Balwani, an Indian immigrant 20 years her senior who made a fortune in the dot-com boom. Balwani was not a disinterested investor. He became Holmes' number two, which might have been okay had Holmes not kept the relationship a secret from investors and the board. Carrie Rue describes the culture of fear and intimidation Balwani fostered at the company. Shouting matches with managers and employees, summary firings, blocked instant messaging to prevent proprietary information leaks. Balwani even directed the IT team to spy on people. Here's Tyler Schultz, who helped bring Theranos' secrets to light on 60 Minutes. I knew how seriously Theranos protected their trade secrets. I knew they would not take it well if they knew that I was talking to regulators. Holmes assisted in creating a toxic work culture. She demanded total loyalty and was quickly angered by disagreements or objections. She froze out any opposition. She would easily fire not just junior hires, but also top people. The company's general counsel, Michael Esquivel, became worried that Elizabeth's revenue projections were overblown. The technology was still being developed and often seemed laughably amateurish. Frequently, it just didn't work. The firm's board met one day, excluding Elizabeth. They concluded that she should be removed as CEO. It looked like the end of Holmes's journey. But something extraordinary happened. Using a mix of charm and contrition, Holmes managed to convince the board members to revert their decision and give her another try. Holmes quickly fired Esquivel, killing off any chance of open debate in the company. The culture of dishonesty and paranoia under Holmes and Balwani led employees to joke that Theranos was a folia du, meaning the presence of the same or similar delusional ideas in two persons closely associated with one another. In this episode of Book Insights, we began the story of Elizabeth Holmes, the youngest female self-made billionaire in history, and the founding of her medical diagnosis tech company, Theranos. Holmes rose extraordinary amounts of capital for Theranos based entirely on fraudulent data and her commanding personality. Holmes and her boyfriend, the second-in-command, Sunny Balwani, founded a toxic and unstable workplace. Next time, we'll continue a discussion of John Carreyrou's bad blood, secrets and lies in a Silicon Valley startup by going into the next chapter of Theranos' history, their entry into consumer pharmacies. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. The next Steve Jobs. The freshman, Elizabeth Holmes, leads the class of 2014. Woman of the Year. Self-made billionaire Elizabeth Holmes backs an even bigger vision. This CEO is out for blood. 
Elizabeth Holmes and her secretive company, Theranos, aimed to revolutionize healthcare. These were the captions highlighting the glowing face of Elizabeth Holmes as she graced the covers of Inc., Forbes, Glamour, E!, and Fortune magazines. This very same CEO was about to endanger the lives of thousands. Was she blinded by her own hype? Or was she always planning on getting away with billions? It seemed that everyone, from Silicon Valley kingmakers to major political figures, was guzzling Elizabeth Holmes' Kool-Aid by the gallon. Here is author John Carreyrou being interviewed by Bloomberg Technology. This notion that a 19-year-old uh, college dropout with just two semesters of chemical engineering under her belt had dropped out of college and pioneered groundbreaking new science. You know, that, that's something that's possible in the realm of computers and computer software. Obviously, with Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates have done that. But in medical science, you need the formal training and you need to do years and decades of research to add Carrie value. Carrie book, Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup, is the result of his investigations into Holmes and Theranos. The rabbit hole would only get deeper. In this book, Insight, we'll investigate the shady dealings of Elizabeth Holmes. In 2011, Holmes negotiated a deal with drugstore chain Walgreens to put Theranos devices in dozens of stores. Customers would get results of 192 blood tests in less than an hour. Walgreens would pre-purchase 50 million worth of its blood cartridges. Walgreens team member Kevin Hunter visited Theranos. He thought it strange that Elizabeth and Sonny Balwani didn't show them the company's lab. They said it was too short notice to do a live blood test. In reality, there was no lab. There was only a basic research and development area. Theranos also made a deal with Safeway. The supermarket juggernaut CEO Steve Bird was a health freak. He believed that health prevention, including simple blood testing for its shoppers, was a route to higher margin business. Safeway loaned Theranos $30 million and planned to do a $350 million renovation of half its 1,700 stores to include smart clinics with Theranos devices. The normally taciturn and tough Steve Bird was in the thrall of Elizabeth. Theranos was going all out to meet the September 2013 launch date for their devices in Walgreens stores. The problem? The devices weren't even close to ready or reliable. Anjali Langari, head of the company's blood testing group, couldn't accept that the public would be guinea pigs for their untested and unreliable technology. The day after Langari resigned, Elizabeth and Sonny held an all-hands meeting. An angry Elizabeth reportedly told the audience that she was building a religion and non-believers should leave. Theranos was evolving into a sort of cult in which objectivity no longer mattered. One was either devoted to the cause in an unquestioning way, or a heretic who could no longer be part of the group. Technical failures wouldn't hold back Elizabeth. She gave presentations to venture capitalists like Partner Fund, an investment management firm. If the big talk wasn't enough to sway investors, the new additions to the board did the trick. They included Reagan advisor George Schultz, Nixon-era Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of Defense William Perry, and four-star General James Mattis. Balwani fabricated revenue estimates. There was even a bold but incorrect claim that the U.S. Army would soon be using Theranos devices on the battlefield with troops in Afghanistan. This all gave the impression of a miracle company only a few years old. In fact, they hadn't really made anything. Elizabeth's 2014 cover story in Fortune featured a photo of herself in her trademark black turtleneck sweater. Forbes followed up with a glowing piece proclaiming Holmes the youngest woman to become a self-made billionaire. Theranos's value rose to $9 billion after Partner Fund invested another $90 million. Elizabeth owned more than half the stock, putting her value close to $5 billion. The Forbes stories were followed by glorifying pieces in many magazines and newspapers, plus profiles on NPR, CNBC, CNN, and CBS News. A healthcare pioneer is being compared to visionaries like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. This morning, Elizabeth Holmes is part of the new Time 100 list just out. Carrie Roo makes the point that a big part of this personality worship was people's desire to see more women succeed in Silicon Valley. Sure, there was Facebook's Sheryl Sandberg and Marissa Mayer of Yahoo, but neither created a company from scratch like Holmes did. Plenty of people wanted to jump on her bandwagon for their own reasons. Cracks in the public image started to appear near the end of 2014. A profile in The New Yorker quoted pathologist Adam Clapper, who wrote an obscure pathology blog. Clapper noted that Theranos had not published peer-reviewed data, and therefore all its claims were doubtful. He didn't have the time or inclination to delve further, but called a contact at the Wall Street Journal, John Carreyrou. 
Here again is Kerry Ru on Bloomberg Technology. To be fair, I probably wouldn't have done anything with that hunch if I hadn't gotten a tip about three, four weeks later. And it was a practicing pathologist in the Midwest who uh, moonlighted as the author of this obscure blog called Pathology Blog. Clapper told Kerry Rue about Alan Beam, a disgruntled Theranos lab director who just resigned from the company. Beam told him that healthy Walgreens customers were getting wrong readings from blood tests. What if a patient had a medical procedure based on a false test? Or worse, a condition didn't show up that they did have. Kerry Rue flew to Phoenix, where Walgreens opened 40 testing centers. He tracked down a doctor, Natalie Sundin, who had complained online about Theranos blood tests. One of her patients, Maureen Gluntz, a real estate broker, came back with a set of scary test results. They included very high levels of calcium, protein, glucose, and live enzymes. Sundin sent the patient to the emergency hospital thinking she might be about to have a stroke. But after a battery of further tests, Gluntz came back normal for everything. She spent $3,000 of her own money on further tests, not to mention the psychological and emotional toll. Another doctor told Carrie Rue of another patient, a pregnant woman. She received Theranos results that read abnormally high in thyroid levels. The woman was already on thyroid medication. Had the dose been increased, her pregnancy would have been at risk. When the patient's blood was retested at Sonora Quest, it came back normal. Carrie Rue and Sundin got their own blood tests by Theranos. His results varied significantly from one obtained at an established analysis company. Hers showed very low levels of cortisol in her blood, which is associated with Addison's disease. The control blood test she did at another company showed no such reading. During his investigations, Kerry Rue learned about Tyler Schultz. Schultz was a junior in mechanical engineering at Stanford University and the grandson of former U.S. Secretary of State George Schultz, one of the eminent people on the Theranos board. Tyler was visiting his grandfather near Stanford one day when Holmes dropped by. Elizabeth told him about the Theranos vision for a healthcare revolution. Tyler was taken in. After he graduated, Tyler Schultz began working for Theranos in the labs. He soon made a worrying discovery. The company encouraged cherry picking of blood samples in order to make it seem that the tests were more accurate. Its report on testing for syphilis said it had 95% accuracy. In reality, it was only 65%. Theranos was also using its own proprietary devices on only a small number of the hundreds of tests it was advertising on its website. Most samples had to be put through blood analyzers made by other companies. The dream that Theranos tested people's blood quickly and accurately on its own devices was a fabrication. Tyler raised all this with his grandfather and Elizabeth. George Schultz told his grandson he was wrong. The elder Schultz had developed a close doting relationship with Elizabeth and was a true believer in her vision. Everywhere you look with this lady, he told a reporter, there's a purity of motivation. Here is Tyler Schultz on 60 Minutes. I had a personal relationship with Elizabeth. She was close to my family, and I felt like she was deceiving my family and the public. Tyler Schultz resigned, and Holmes set her legal attack dogs after him. She believed he'd been talking to Carrie Rue, which by this time he was. Holmes wanted to sue him for breach of confidentiality. The company also stonewalled on answering any of Carrie Rue's detailed questions, citing trade secrets. In this episode of Book Insights, we learned that Elizabeth Holmes wrapped major corporations, venture capitalists, and even political powers around her little finger through subterfuge, charm, manipulation, and pure force of will. Along with Sunny Balwani, Holmes was able to turn Theranos into her own cult of personality despite the company's failure to produce any kind of finished product. Cracks began to show when a New Yorker piece poked holes in the company's science, alerting Wall Street Journal reporter John Kerry Rue. His investigation shone light on Theranos' fraudulent and dangerous activities. The testing machines in Walgreens and Safeway stores were producing many faulty diagnoses. Soon, Tyler Schultz, Theranos employee and grandson of George Schultz, a member of the company board, blew the whistle. The fall had begun. Next time, we'll conclude the story of Bad Blood and chronicle the end of Theranos. We will find out how Holmes went from a multi-billion dollar net worth to nothing. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. People don't even know 
that they have a basic human right to be able to get access to information about themselves and their own bodies. This is Elizabeth Holmes, CEO and founder of medical technology startup Theranos. She's speaking on behalf of her company, whose only goal is to provide fast and easy blood testing accessible to everyone. She's talking directly into the camera. She radiates compassion. Her heart bleeds for you. In 2014, Holmes was worth $4.5 billion. Her company, Theranos, was worth twice that. Investors, political figures, and major corporations were falling over themselves to give her money. She was that convincing. The only problem was her device, her system for providing better blood testing. It didn't work. It barely existed. And as that became more and more clear, the further Theranos and Holmes fell. Was Elizabeth Holmes a victim of her own ambition? A dreamer unable to dig her way out of the lies? Or was she a stone-cold sociopath with a god complex? In the final part of this book insight, we'll discuss Theranos' final grasps for survival and Holmes' attempts to avoid the fall. We'll conclude with the question, was Holmes morally bankrupt or just lost? Elizabeth Holmes used her connections in 2015 to get Vice President Joe Biden to visit Theranos. Holmes didn't want to show him her labs with its blood analyzers from other companies. Instead, she built a fake automated lab with rows of Theranos mini-labs apparently testing blood. Theranos had finished another round of funding worth $430 million. The company had a headcount of 500 and moved into a brand new office. Elizabeth's workspace was not part of the open plan area and mimicked the Oval Office in layout. She insisted that the windows be made of bulletproof glass. Carrie piece on Theranos appeared in an October 2015 edition of the Wall Street Journal. It focused on the medical dangers of the company's faulty tests, quoting doctors and patients. The piece threw into question the lofty valuations of this most prized of unicorns. The article, quietly devastating to Theranos' reputation, was an instant sensation. It was covered widely by other media and was the talk of Silicon Valley. Holmes was booked to attend a Wall Street Journal Live event in California, DLive, the following week. Astonishingly, she attended. She was combative, she denied everything raised by the journal piece, and issued a lengthy rebuttal on the Theranos website. But Carrie Rue and the Wall Street Journal continued to publish stories about Theranos. They noted Walgreens had scaled back its agreement with the company and that Safeway had pulled out. They reported that Theranos was operating without a lab director for months. Here is Holmes on Mad Money with Jim Cramer. This is what happens when you work to change things. And first they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. And um, I, I have to say, I, I, I personally was shocked to see that the journal would publish something like this. Holmes hit back further. She claimed all the allegations were the result of sexism. Why did every news piece on her begin with stating her gender? Had they done the same thing for Mark Zuckerberg? She continued to offer herself as a role model for ambitious girls wanting to study science subjects. She turned up at Glamour Magazine's Woman of the Year event to accept an award. Here is Holmes in a Glamour video piece produced for her award. Our dream for Theranos is that every single day, someone's life is better because they can afford access to health information they couldn't afford before. The problems kept mounting up. The federal regulator of chemical laboratories, CMS, paid a surprise visit to Theranos. It then published a letter in early 2016 saying that Theranos' labs posed immediate jeopardy to patient health and safety. It could lose federal certification. Kerry Rue managed to get a leaked copy of CMS's full 121-page report on Theranos. It was damning. It turned out that Theranos used its own devices for only 12 of the 250 blood tests it advertised for. The rest was done by off-the-shelf commercial blood analyzers. Of the tests the company actually did, they varied wildly from results of commercial machines. All this would naturally lead doctors to make wrong decisions about a patient's care. Sonny Balwani became the fall guy, though his forced exit wasn't enough to stop the corporate death spiral underway. The U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco and the Securities and Exchange Commission were now investigating the company. Bizarrely, Holmes continued to promote the company's wares, Carrie Rue watched her on stage at a conference of laboratory scientists and was amazed at her confidence unveiling the revised mini-lab, talking about how it would save lives. He realized that Holmes was a saleswoman extraordinaire. He writes, Like her idol Steve Jobs, she emitted a reality distortion field that forced people to momentarily suspend disbelief. 
But the public and investor backlash had begun. Partner funds sued Theranos to get some of the money back, as did Walgreens. The state of Arizona got Theranos to deposit over $4 million into a fund to compensate the 76,000 people who had taken Theranos blood tests, some of whom banded together to launch a class action against the company. Kerry Rue is clear. If Theranos testing had been rolled out in Walgreens 8,000-plus stores, people would have died as the result of misdiagnosed blood tests. While all this was happening, Kerry Rue had not been able to contact Tyler Schultz. After tracking him down at a new job, he learned that Schultz had become estranged from his grandfather. George Schultz had continued to be a true believer in Holmes over his own grandson, and Holmes had attended his 95th birthday in San Francisco. Grandfather and grandson now communicated only through lawyers. By the end of 2017, Theranos was running almost on empty. Having spent a fortune on legal costs, its 800 employees shrunk to 130. The Securities and Exchange Commission charged Theranos and Holmes with creating an elaborate fraud in March 2018. Holmes lost control of the company, paid a $500,000 fine, and was barred from being a director of a public company for 10 years. Here is a report from the Bay Area Silicon Valley local news station, KPIX. Now, if convicted, Holmes and Balwani face a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison, a fine of a quarter of a million dollars, plus restitution for each count of wire fraud and each conspiracy count. She and Sonny Balwani have separately been indicted by a federal grand jury on nine counts of wire fraud. The trial of the pair is still to be played out, but they could end up with prison sentences or at least criminal records. Theranos was finished as a company in August of 2018. If it's true that Theranos was essentially an elaborate fraud, the question remains, why did Holmes do it? Is Holmes a sociopath? Her high levels of charisma and intelligence were backed by a certain lack of conscience. When giving talks on stage or speaking to the press, Holmes was able to convey deep compassion, to exude the vibe that she's all about helping humanity. She liked to tell the story of her uncle who died of cancer, about how close they were. In fact, they weren't. Her own family thought it indecent she was using her uncle's death to promote her company. What Carrie Rue does say is that in her quest to create the healthcare equivalent of Apple or Uber, Holmes' moral compass went awry. When it comes to the promise of great riches, people believe what they want to believe. So it was. The little girl who wanted to be a billionaire, the woman who cast her spell on countless powerful people, fell to ruin. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice.